Good morning. Uh, as you can see, I'm dressed for work because I do have a paying job that I need to go to as soon as our worship service is over. So our uh, message is entitled simply Faith. Now faith and belief are intrinsically intertwined, yet they are separate. So in the next 15 to 20 minutes, I hope that we can untie them enough that uh, we have a better understanding of what each of them are. Our epistles reading from uh, the letter to the Hebrews leads us to understand that it is because people trust God that they are sure that they will receive the things that they confidently expect God to give them. They are also certain that they will see those things happen, though no one has seen them yet. So maybe we need to take just a moment and try and get a, an understanding of the difference between faith and belief. And the amazing story of Charles Blondin, who was a famous French tightrope walker, is a wonderful illustration of what true faith is. Blondin's greatest uh, fame came on September 14, 1860, when he became the first person to cross a tightrope stretched 11,000 uh, yeah, 11, feet, that's over a quarter of a mile, across the mighty Niagara Falls. And people from both Canada and America came from miles away to see this great feat. He walked across 160 feet above the falls several times, each time with a different daring feat. Once in a sack, on stilts, on a bicycle, in the dark and blindfolded. One time he even carried a stove and cooked an omelet in the middle of the rope. Now a large crowd gathered and uh, the buzz of excitement ran along both sides of the riverbank. The crowd oohed and awed as Blondin carefully walked across one dangerous step after another, pushing a wheelbarrow, holding a sack of potatoes. Then at one point he asked for the participation of a volunteer. Upon reaching the other side, the crowd's applause was louder than the roar of the falls, and Blondin suddenly stopped and addressed his audience. Do you believe that I can carry a person across in this wheelbarrow? And the crowd enthusiastically yelled, Yes, you're the greatest tightrope walker in the world. We believe. Okay, said Blondin. Who wants to get in the wheelbarrow? Well, as far as the Blondin story goes, no one did at that time. Now this unique story illustrates a real-life picture of what faith actually is. See, the crowd watched these daring feats. They said they believed, and their reactions proved that uh, they truly did not believe. They didn't have faith. So similarly, it is one thing for us to say we believe in God. However, it's true faith when we believe God and put our faith and trust in his son, Jesus Christ. Now here's a micro sermon at no extra charge. Faith and fear cannot coexist in the human heart or mind. Everyone knows fear, has been fearful, literally full of fear, afraid of the dark, the unknown, heights, dangerous animals or people. Now, some fears are God-given for our protection to lead us away from danger. However, there are times when we are called to let our faith in God lead us into and through danger. Remember that Jesus sent out 72 disciples into Galilee, and he said, I'm sending you as lambs among wolves. God sent Moses back to Egypt, which he had fled in fear for his life. God sent Gideon into battle with the most vicious war machine of that age. And God whittled away at Gideon's army until only 300 were left to battle 120,000 trained soldiers. And what weapons did they take into battle? Horns and torches. But mostly they took their faith in God. Fear, just to mention the word fear, uh, is to bring some strange emotions surging through my body. I feel a strange tightness in my chest and a tightening of the muscles of my body. Uh, my stomach begins to react in strange ways. But it is 
in these times of fear that Jesus lays the blame for fear squarely on my lack of faith. Now the author of the letter to the Hebrews, that is to the Jews, reminds his readers that it was because their ancestors trusted in God that he commended them. It was their faith that allowed them to overcome their fears. It is because we, the author here speaking as a Jewish Christian, speaking to fellow Jews, says we trust in God and we understand that God formed the universe by commanding that it exist. That is speaking it into existence through the logos in Christianity. The logos is the name or title of Jesus Christ derived from the prologue to the gospel of John where he says in the beginning the word capitalized word and the word was with God and the word was God so the author to the uh, Jews was uh, reminding them that in their very first scriptures their most sacred of writings is to call to mind excerpts from Genesis when it says God said let there be light God said let there be a horizon in the middle of the water. God said, let the water under the sky come together in one area. And God said, let the earth produce vegetation. God said, let there be lights in the sky. God said, let the water swarm with swimming creatures. Then God said, let's make humans in our image, in our likeness. So the Jewish readers to the Gospel of John would understand how this introduction echoed the Genesis account. In the beginning was the Word. The Word already existed. The Word was with God and the Word was God. They would also come to understand that the Word was a term applied by John to Jesus, the second person in the Godhead and in his eternal existence. Just as he is called the life and the light, because he has in himself life and light and imparts them to his creatures at his pleasure. So he is also called the Word because in him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge and by his word and spirit he reveals them to men. The result is that the things that we see were not made from things that already exist. Now back to our letter to the Hebrews. It says it was because Abraham trusted God that when he was called he obeyed God. He left his own country and went to a place that God would give him. Abraham left his own country even though he did not know where he would be going. Now what would you pack if God said to you leave your land, your relatives, your father's home and go to the land that I will show you? Abram didn't know where he was going or how long he'd be there. So he took along his wife, Sarai, his nephew, Lot, and all the possessions that they had accumulated and the servants that they had acquired in Haran. In other words, he took everything with no expectation of ever returning. It was because Abraham trusted God that he lived as though he were a foreigner in the land that God had promised to him. He went not knowing where he was going, therefore his obedience was the fullest proof of his faith in God, and his faith was an implicit faith, completely, wholeheartedly, and perfect trust. He obeyed and went out from his country, having no prospect of any good or success. In other words, he wasn't guaranteed anything other than that God said, go where I take you. But uh, his faith led him to expect from God. Now, he knew God as a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So keep that in mind. God is a rewarder of those that consciously seek him. Abraham lived in tents and his son Isaac and his grandson Jacob did also. 
God promised to give them the same things that he promised to Abraham. Abraham was waiting to live in a city in heaven that would remain forever. It was a city that God is building. It was because Abraham trusted God that God gave Abraham strength so that he was able to produce a son, even though his wife, Sarah, was beyond the time when women bear children. God promised that he would give her a son, and Abraham considered that God would do what God promised. So, although Abraham was too old to have children, from that one man people descended, who are as many as the number of the stars in the skies, and are as countless as the grains of sand along the shore, just like God promised him. The author of Hebrews continues, it was while they still trusted in God that these people died, even though they had not yet received the things that God had promised to give them. It was as though they saw those things in a distance. Interestingly, the author points out that those great men had faith, that led them to follow God into unknown places, and yet they never saw the promised reward. Now that did not make the promise false. It was fulfilled, just not in their lifetimes. See, our generation has become one of seeking instant gratification. TV shows and movies present a problem and they solve it in the space of a, a half hour to two hours. You want information about some place? You don't have to travel there. Just Google it and everything you want to know is right there at your fingertips. So the idea that we might not see the fruit of our faith makes us a little uneasy. That is why it is important to understand Hebrews 11.1 1, when it says, faith assures us of things we expect and convinces us of the existence of things we cannot see. The assurance and validation for things in the future are proven by remembering the things in the past, by calling to mind that God has always done what God said he would do. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were glad to know about what God promised. It was as though they admitted that they were not from this earth but they were only here temporarily. Well, we, like Abraham, are strangers in this world. We are members of a kingdom that, Jesus said, is not of this world. When we accept Jesus as our Lord, it means we give him complete control over our lives. Again, the author wrote, as for those people who say they believe such thing, they clearly show that they long for a place that will be their true native land. If Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had been thinking about that kingdom being the place from which they had come, I had been, if they had been thinking that the kingdom that they were promised was the same kingdom they had come from, they would have just taken the opportunity to return to that spot. But instead, they desired a better place in which to live. That is, they desired a home in heaven. So God has prepared a city for them to live in, and he is pleased for them to say that he is their God. Now, I found this interesting article about faith, uh, as the book of James understood it. The author says it better than I do, so I will simply quote him. Beginning quotes here. Evidently, there were some in the early church who flirted with the notion that faith could be a static, inert, inanimate assent to facts. The book of James, probably the earliest of the New Testament epistles, confronts this error. James sounds almost as if he were writing to 20th century no lordship advocates. Now I'm interesting the quote here for uh, a point and that's to enter in an explanation about what he's talking about when he's talking about no lord lordship. No lordship is the opposite of the doctrine of lordship, or salvation, which teaches that submitting to Christ as Lord goes hand in hand with trusting in Christ as Savior. Lordship salvation is the opposite of what is sometimes called easy believing, or 
teaching that salvation comes through an acknowledgement of certain set of facts. Now, back to the quote. He, James, says that people can be deluded into thinking they believe when in fact they do not. And he says that the single factor that distinguishes counterfeit faith from the real thing is the righteous behavior inevitably produced by those who have authentic faith. These are the questions the Lordship Salvation debate must ultimately answer. Is it enough to know and understand and assent to the facts of the gospel? Even hold the inward conviction that these truths apply to me personally and never yet shun sin or submit to the Lord Jesus? Is a person who holds that kind of belief guaranteed eternal life? Does such a hope constitute faith in the sense in which the scriptures use the term? James expressly teaches that it does not. Real faith, he says, will produce righteous behavior. And a true character of saving faith may be examined in light of the believer's works. Now this is consistent with all of the Old and New Testament uh, teachings. One enters into salvation by grace through faith. Faith is by nature turned towards obedience. In Acts 5.32 we read, we are witness to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Notice those words, those who obey him. In Romans 1.5, Paul wrote about the obedience that is associated with faith. He continues this reasoning when he wrote in Romans 2.7-8, through 8, He will give everlasting life to those who search for glory, honor, and immortality by persisting in doing what is good. But he will bring anger and fury on those in selfish pride who refuse to believe the truth and who follow what is wrong. In Romans 16 26, the author again wrote about the action of obedience being associated with faith when he said, the everlasting God ordered that what the prophets wrote down be shown to the people of every nation and bring them to the obedience that is associated with faith. So it's clear that James believed that good works are inevitable in the life of one who truly believes. These works have no part in bringing about a salvation. However, they show that salvation is indeed present. See, Ephesians uh, 2, 8 through 9 says, God saved you through faith as an act of kindness. You had nothing to do with it. Being saved is a gift from God. It is not the result of anything you've done, so no one can brag about it. And in Titus 3, 4 through 5, it says, When our God, Savior, made his kindness and love for humanity appear, he saved us, but not because of anything we had done to gain his approval. Instead, because of his mercy, he saved us, through the washing in which the Holy Spirit gives us new birth and renewal. Okay, just to be sure that we're on the same track here. Salvation is not, an, uh, is not earned. It is an unearned gift from God through the blood of Jesus when he died on the cross. However, along with the gift, there is an obligation to live a new and different life as proof of salvation. Clearly, Paul and James both believed that faith is an action word. Belief can be passive, but faith cannot be. We are called to God and given salvation so that we may be of service. When Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19, so wherever you go, make disciples of all nations, Baptize them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those are marching orders for every Christian.